You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. Is, is this thing on? Oh. <clears throat> Attention! Attention all wildlife explorers! The wait is finally over! Please return to base camp. I repeat, please return to base camp. I don't know about you, but I think we are long overdue for another thrilling encounter at the San Diego Zoo. It's been what, like four weeks? Our previous adventures had me going on about the zoo's revolutionary past. Whether it was related to some of America's first open-air carnivore enclosures, their giant aviaries, environments that were brought to life using native plants. Today's topic is children's zoos. You might see them as petting zoos, small farms, or a last-ditch effort for parents to finally get their kids to pay attention to something. As you can tell from this extremely abstract map, San Diego was never about that. Their children's zoo debuted in 1957 and lived on to see the 21st century. Like most exhibits though, time wasn't exactly kind to it. At least it was still different though, In that fact remains true today. The Wildlife Explorers Base Camp, a three-acre, long-anticipated campaign that's well worth the $88 million spent to create it. It features eight new buildings, new innovative elements, and nearly 100 different species in four habitat zones. Though it is a children's zoo, the zoo says that the base camp was designed to inspire all ages to learn about nature, play, and encounter new creatures to develop an empathy for wildlife. Before we start, I again must thank my zoo pal Mark for traveling to San Diego to help me make these videos even better. And for this question of the episode, I simply want to know, what is your favorite attraction at the San Diego Zoo? To get to the base camp from the entrance, all you have to do is take a left into the Discovery Outpost and go past the Reptile Complex. But we're not walking in just yet. A year before the base camp officially opened, the zoo was kind enough to offer two teaser exhibits. The first one would have been a great way to start off, but the zoo said, psych, twice. Phase one was dedicated to the ultimate island giant, the Komodo dragon. They showed up in San Diego in 1963 and have been a staple species since the mid 90s. In fact, at one point, they were the only zoo in America that had them. Their new kingdom is designed like a cul-de-sac. So the dragons surround their guests from nearly every angle. The three enclosures try to mimic the beaches mountains and forests of the Komodo Island, which are always kept at around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If the lizard doesn't feel like that's enough, some of the rocks are heated to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And if that's too much, there's plenty of dirt for burrowing. Naturally, it's how they cool off and where they lay their eggs. According to the Union Tribune, you'd be looking at Satu and Ratu, a male and female pair. And yes, word around Komodo says that the zoo is hopeful the two will one day breed. So the base camp launched with one of the world's most fearsome lizards and some of the world's smallest birds. You may have to wait to see them, but it's totally worth it. Just remember to wash your shoes first before exploring one of San Diego's many walkthrough aviaries, the hummingbird habitat. We'll get to them, but you're also surrounded by 15 other kinds of birds. As we looked around the right half, we spotted the spotted tanager from the montane forests of South America. My eyes widened at the sight of the green-backed trogon. Trogon is Greek for nibbling or biting. It doesn't refer to the way that they eat, rather the way they create tree cavities for nesting. Their size makes them a little more intimidating than the others in here, although all they really do is prefer a motionless lifestyle. It didn't really seem to matter that there were no hummingbirds at this point, because the people were far more interested in the strange, unmistakable Waddle Jacana. 
Jacanas are waders or shorebirds found in the marshlands and lagoons in Africa, Asia, Australia, and in this case, South America. A very interesting bird indeed, but they weren't attracting the flock of humans just because of their unique look. Their chicks might have had something to do with it. Many zoos breed birds successfully behind the scenes, so far too often do you rarely ever see the result. A female will lay her clutch on floating plants. The males will then take it from there, while the mother will seek out just about as many males as she can mate with. Motherhood may not be an interest, but she will prevent other females from getting involved with her nesting males. The men will incubate the eggs, not by sitting on them. They shuffle them under their wings, and if the nest starts to submerge, he can just pick them up with his wings and place them somewhere safe. And within a few hours after hatching, the chicks are not only able to walk, they're able to swim and dive below the surface. So far, this is clearly one of San Diego's best developments, but it isn't without criticism. Some zoo fans are exactly in favor of the rock work, claiming that it lacks any kind of realism. Though some defend the idea is to let the vegetation grow and hide the rock anyways, it has a ways to go in the middle. But this aviary's other half has already grown into a mini mature forest, where we got to see the quail crested dove, Pompadour Katinga, the Jacanas once more, and what the zoo calls the jeweled marvels of the air. Did you see it? Well, if not, here's another chance. Of course, I'm referring to the hummingbird. At least 330 kinds exist all of which live in the Americas. They can fly forward, up, down, backwards, and is one out of only a handful of birds that are capable of hovering. Depending on the species, the hummingbird will beat its wings between 20 to 80 times per second. They're so fast, it not only gives them the illusion of levitation, but their vibrations make it sound like they're humming a tune. It's no surprise that they have the highest energy output of any warm-blooded creature. So to keep their spirits up, they must consume 3 to 7 calories each day. It doesn't sound like much, but that's equivalent to you eating over 100,000 calories. If a zoo mentions that they have hummingbirds, it usually means that they have a hummingbird garden, much like San Diego does by the aviary's entrance. So in other words, they are very hard to find in American zoos, but the average San Diego visitor probably doesn't even realize that, as hummingbirds have been a regular feature to the Discovery Outpost since 1964. All right, now it's time to explore the actual base camp. We first stopped in the rainforest section in the Spineless Marvel's Insect House. I know many people who find these unsettling, but this was designed to leave those negative feelings at the door. The entire ceiling depicts a migration flyover, projecting a rotation of birds, butterflies, and various insects. The real bugs are spread out in at least 15 well-detailed displays. The black beauty stick insect, ghost mantises, a cloud of lubber grasshoppers, and an intrusion of cockroaches from Madagascar. The next swarm continues in a second room with domino roaches, leaf insects, white-eyed assassin bugs, the jade-headed buffalo beetle, and more. Spineless Marvels lets you get hands-on, not with the bugs, but at the microscope station, providing an even closer look at creatures that we might otherwise miss out in the wild. Speaking of new perspectives, the walls are lined with giant honeycomb fragments, making us as small as a busy bee. Illuminated in red is a real hive of western honeybees. Even if you don't agree, they are one of nature's closest friends. Nectar that contains grains of pollen are collected by the bees as they fly from flower to flower. The nectar can be stored in their throats until it's time to head back to the hive, where it's then converted into honey. Bees are essential to many plants who rely on them to spread pollen and in turn produce more and more plants. 
and of course both humans and other creatures rely on them for their honey. In fact, I heard that the honey and honeycombs produced by these bees are used as enrichment for other species around the zoo. I found the last corner to be the most interesting. What's displayed here moves way less than, let's say, the ghost mantis. These are several lines of pinned cocoons. A great way to foreshadow the hot and humid butterfly greenhouse. Even though the colony was on the small side, it didn't take us too long to realize that blue morphos were right above our heads. It doesn't quite match the scenery of the meadow projection, but I did get word that the zoo is still working on expanding the population behind the scenes. Butterfly rooms usually get a skip from me. No, I'm not afraid of them. They're just never really unique. Can't say that about San Diego's though, and you'll see why near the end of the video. You know what's one thing San Diego has that Columbus doesn't? A lot, but in this case, halfway decent exhibits for rotating ambassador animals. It was looking a little empty on the right. Fortunately, the middle showed off the caracal. The coolest cat of Africa, Middle East and Northwest India. Their other name is the desert lynx. Yet, they are not part of the lynx family. They're believed to be closely related to the serval and golden cat. At one point, they were considered a lynx, but the caracal has a more slender build longer legs, longer tail, and lack any spotted or blotched markings. But when they have ears like that, who can really blame them for thinking otherwise? Speaking of something that doesn't always have the correct name, there's Southeast Asia's Binturong, or as us normal people in Cincinnati call them, the Bearcat. Looks like a mashup of the two, but they are neither a bear or a cat. They are part of a family of civets and genets. The origin of the Binturong's name is apparently unknown, as the local language no longer exists. But I do wonder if it had anything to do with that tale. Binturongs are only one of two classified carnivores with a prehensile tail, and hopefully we'll see them put it to good use in future episodes. Wildlife Explorers Base Camp has a hummingbird house, an insect house, and the cool critters is mostly a reptile house. The first thing that caught my eye was the staff only accessible incubation room, followed with a line of skeletal displays of mostly out of this world critters. In the center is the building's own microscope station, except this details unique adaptations that reptiles use to hunt and eat. I recall counting at least nine exhibits, 10 if you count this signed reticulated python skeleton. I won't go into much detail about every animal, but we did see the Fiji banded iguana, prehensile or monkey tailed skink, Angolan python, the rosy boa, Madagascar tree boa, green tree monitors, and a few more. That does it for most of the base camp's rainforest section. The wild woods takes up nearly half of the attraction space. The top level is accessible via a rope bridge guarded by two giant spiders on either end. It's taking us to the tree of dreams. Just one of the base camp's many examples of where play can be turned into inspiration. The next habitat's upper viewing is a bouncing net but if that's not your thing, you can always watch them on the forest floor. The Guianan Squirrel Monkey is just one of several subspecies of squirrel monkey found in the tropical regions of Central and South America. I did read a couple of sources that claim that they got their name because they look like squirrels. I mean, they're both on the small side, one of the smallest monkeys out there in fact. Their name most likely reflects their behavior. They're naturally quick, nimble, agile, and on the nervous side. In other words, squirrely. This is where I learned that if any species is going to be the face of a children's zoo, it shouldn't be a goat or some other farm animal. It should be something that's always on the go, that matches a child's energy. The rest of the wild woods is pretty much one giant splash pad, perfect for those hot summer days, or nearly winter like it was here. This area has one other species, but it didn't quite match the area's spirit, as we might as well have missed their South American coatis. 
If you don't know much about this exhibit, you might think that you've seen it all, but nope, you're not done yet. It's time to walk through the marsh meadows. It starts out as two ponds on either side of the path. The right one was filled with a bunch of unsigned turtles, while the left apparently contains one of the dwarf crocodiles seen on the Monkey Trails episode. But no one was home. At least the one in Africa Rocks was always visible. You're once again invited into the Cool Critters building. But this time it's dedicated to life in the water. Right away, you'll notice that the ceiling is lined with blue neon lights, complemented by painted koi fish and frogs on the floor, to kind of give the sense that you're underwater. As for the animals, I was really looking forward to debuting the Chinese giant salamander, but this is all I got. Same could be said for the South American lungfish on the other side. I did see the semi-aquatic caiman lizard, but they'll get their moment soon. I thought my luck had run out there, but the day was saved by the West African lungfish. Thanks to its very special adaptations, they've survived for nearly 400 million years. Like us, they have a pair of lungs that can take in oxygen above the surface. A much needed advantage for something that lives in waterways that are known to dry up from time to time which allows the lungfish to live out of the water for up to a whole year. The remaining tanks and critters are on the smaller side. The Pascagoula map turtle is restricted to the Pascagoula River in Mississippi. That area has quite the number of turtle species, so the biggest way you can identify them is by the large colored blotch in between their eyes. They're listed as endangered by the IUCN, but are not listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, though there are proposals to change that. The Amazon milk frog knows how to draw a crowd and rid of one at the same time. If they feel the need to tell you or anything else to back off, they'll secrete a milky white substance. This keeps the frog hydrated, but it's also poisonous. It doesn't make them as toxic as a dart frog, but if ingested, it will cause the predator to feel sick and maybe even leave other milk frogs alone. The fully aquatic Lake Titicaca water frog has a similar tactic. They're considered an apex predator, so threats are usually limited to just us. But when they're stressed, the frog will also secrete a milky substance. Though not poisonous, it's still not exactly described as a treat. Axolotls, or ajolote, roughly translates to water monster in an ancient Aztec language. If you know anything about the internet, you probably know that's just a slight exaggeration. These monsters are salamanders, famous for their youthful look and permanent smile, which explains why they're one of the world's most popular pets. And it's kind of ironic, considering the axolotl is critically endangered the lower level's hands-on station is essentially a giant trivia game about salamanders, and I'm really sad to say that yours truly did horrible. There's just one more smaller tank teeming with swimming sunburst diving beetles, and one more that's viewable from inside the Cool Critters building just outside the exit and above by the ambassador animals viewing. Sadly, we missed the dwarf caimans it contains, but we did see yellow spotted Amazon river turtles. We are underneath the canopy view of the ambassador animals, where you'll come across a very rocky exhibit for Burmese star tortoises, who did not show. Like the cool critters, you're invited to explore the spineless marvels once more. It continues where you left off, with the lower part of the butterfly room, it's too bad that I didn't notice that this displays a coconut crab. Fortunately, we didn't really miss out as some of you already saw that they were featured in the last episode. As weird as it is to say, a giant crab wasn't even the most surprising thing about this building. Remember this tree? Well, look at it very closely. It's an open air habitat for thousands of leaf cutter ants contained by just a small body of water, smaller than a pencil's eraser, and able to carry 50 times its own weight. We've had previous episodes that have covered their natural purpose, but it doesn't hurt to say it again. Their job is to cut leaves, 
and farm them in a special nest. So where is it? Well, these ants can travel through these tree roots under water. And if you were to go into the next room, you'd find several underground pods where they feed the leaves to a mat of fungus until the fungus is big enough for the ants to consume. As you might expect, this takes a lot of teamwork. To communicate, they release pheromones, and every release is like a new message. They'll tell each other where to go to harvest new leaves, where to go to remove dead ants, and even one to alarm and prepare the colony to fight against any intruders. The ant world carries on with smaller pods for honeypot and carpenter ants, world-renowned excavators that build smooth tunnels and nests in wood, much like termites. Right across from them is a museum-like display that shines light on aluminum replicas of tunnels created by ants that we otherwise would never be able to see. The nest theme does not end there. The next colony is kept behind a glass partition. The tunnels near the top are further back, while the lower portion is closest to us. A mostly classic naked mole rat exhibit. One of the few mammals that lives like an insect. But that's not all there is to this display though. If you were to go past them, and if you wait long enough, a virtual naked mole rat will come crawling towards you, as if you're actually in the tunnel with them. And the following room, and yes there's more, brings you to seven kinds of arachnids, mostly tarantulas, supported by the signs on the wall. This room wants you to realize that even though tarantulas are considered fearsome predators, they're not out to get you. And without them, your home would probably be overrun with other unwanted creepy crawlers. The big guys were kept behind the glass, but they do have an orb weaver that's pretty much free to leave whenever they please. Sadly, they weren't on display, which thinking about it, I guess wasn't a good sign. Additional standard exhibits present the giant cave cockroach, New Guinea stick insects, and children's stick insects. The final spineless marvel has two huge mirrored floor to ceiling forests. The Goliath stick insect of Australia. I know, where else? Nearly 10 inches long. And you know what makes them even cooler? They can fly usually only the males. Their name is just slightly ironic though, as they're not even the largest or longest stick insect in the world. With the next breath of fresh air, it means you're in the desert dune section. I'd go into more detail of the area, but this lazy cameraman had his finger nearly covering the lens the whole time. So to summarize, there are two habitats placed literally back to back. One for prairie dogs and burrowing owls, which weren't even on display. And the other was for the fennec fox, our final species that, that probably perfectly reflects how you're feeling right now. That concludes your very extensive free of charge journey into the Wildlife Explorers Base Camp, the supreme, most unique, and most effective children's zoo in America. San Diego set the standard for them back then and created a new standard with this one. Now as I sign off, please let me know what you thought of this revolutionary exhibit. Remember to stay tuned, and from the one person that runs zoo tours, you stay classy San Diego.